And to explain our system, unlike anyone can explain our system, is a guy now who has just started his own television show on the Fox Business Network, and it is now the number one rated show on the Fox Business Network. A very good friend of mine, a very deep thinker, a controversial man in some circles, but not in my circles, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. I have never been to Salt Lake City before. What a beautiful valley this is. I am an old-fashioned pre-Vatican II Roman Catholic, but I can tell you, something blessed happened here in 1847. I was trying a, I was trying a case when I was on the bench in New Jersey a small claims case, so you walk out into the courtroom, there are this many people in the courtroom, and they each want their case heard before lunchtime because at 1.30 in the afternoon, the same size crowd will return. The typical case is the dry cleaner ruined my dress, but he also tried to pick up my sister. So a lawyer, a lawyer says to me, Your Honor, I need a translator to, to present this case to you. I said, what's the language? He said, Italian. I called the courthouse administrator, the courthouse Italian translator was in another courtroom. So I said to the throngs, is there anybody here that can speak Italian? Little guy in the back raises his hand, he comes up, we swear in the translator, we swear in the witness, here's exactly what happens. Lawyer to translator, tell the court your name. Translator to witness, what is it you name? I said, let me see where this is going to go. <laughs> Ask the next question, counselor. All right, Your Honor. Lawyer to translator, give the court your address. Translator to witness, where is your house? <laughs> I looked at this character. I said to him, I thought you told me that you could speak Italian. He said, I can, Your Honor, but my English, she's not so good. One time I was picking a jury in a criminal case in New Jersey where I sat on the bench. The judge picks the jury. So again, you walk out into a courtroom with a crowd this size, and from a crowd well, a little smaller than this, you have to extract 12 people who have no bias, no interest, no prejudice, no knowledge of the case, no concern with the outcome. This was a drug distribution case. I had a feeling that there were some people in this courtroom that didn't want to be on the jury. So I said, is there anybody here that can't serve on the jury? Little lady raised her hand and I said, yes, madam, what is it? She said, I can't be on this jury because of my occupation. I thought, well, all right, drug distribution case, what could this lady do? I said, all right, madam, what do you do? She said, I'm a soothsayer. A soothsayer? This is 1995. Who calls themselves a soothsayer? I fell for it. I said, all right, madam, how does this keep you from being on this case? She said, judge, I already know how it ends up. <laughs> I should have said, lady, tell us now and save us the next three weeks in the courtroom. <laughs> all right, from ridiculous trials to sublime and serious and history-changing trials. Some men say the earth is round, and some men say it is flat. But if it is round, could an act of parliament make it flat? And if it is flat, could the king's command make it round? This was an argument made by Thomas More on his trial for high treason. The alleged act of treason was the refusal to acknowledge that the king was the head of the church on earth and could make any law he wanted. When Moore made this argument to his jury, he was not only appealing to their common sense, of course the parliament couldn't make a flat earth round, and of course the king couldn't make a round earth flat, he was appealing to their understanding 
of what lawyers and philosophers, and I hope you after today, understand to be the natural law, the natural order of things. The order in the universe created by God cannot be changed by man. It's a pretty basic principle and a pretty basic concept. The argument would be made by Thomas Aquinas. It had been refined from Aristotle. It would be articulated by John Locke. It would be written down by Thomas Jefferson. When Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is life, our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He was arguing that our rights come from our humanity and that these rights are inalienable, meaning they cannot be taken away from us. And he was making that argument from the natural law, the same argument that Thomas More unsuccessfully made to his jury. Before Jefferson made that argument, we were, of course, colonists. And we were ruled over by a king and a parliament 3,000 miles away. It seems crazy today that an island would rule a continent with 3,000 miles between them at a time when it took three months to get across the ocean. But that's the, the law and the oppression under which we suffered for 200 years. The king and the parliament had ingenious ways of raising money from us. And one of those ways was called the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act required that every piece of paper in your possession, every book, every pamphlet, every legal document, every financial document, even a poster you were going to nail to a tree had to bear the king's image. It had to have a stamp with the king's face on it. You think the post office is rough today? You had to go to a foreign post office in the United States and buy a stamp with the sitting king's image on it and put it on every piece of paper in your house. Question. How did the king know if his image was on every piece of paper in your house? Answer, the parliament enacted the Townsend Acts. The Townsend Acts gave British soldiers the power to write their own search warrants. So they would show up at your home, knock on the door, hand you a piece of paper in which they had authorized themselves to enter your house, ostensibly to look for the stamps. Of course, while there, they might help themselves to food, to alcohol, to furniture. They would frequently even help themselves to the house, which is why we have the Third Amendment that prohibits quartering of troops against the wishes of the owner of the house. This was the last straw. The Stamp Act was so unpopular, even among some of the British ruling classes, that Parliament rescinded it. But the damage was already done. We fought a revolution. We won the revolution. We wrote a constitution. And when we wrote the constitution, we assured ourselves that the things that the king and the parliament did to us when we were colonists, the government that we would popularly elect and choose ourselves, would never do to us when we are Americans. When we wrote the constitution in the hot and sticky summer of 1787, in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, by the Delaware River, there was a great debate. And the debate went back to what Thomas More had argued to his jury, and Thomas Jefferson had written in the Declaration of Independence, and Thomas Aquinas had written as the natural law, and that was, where does freedom come from? The small government people, James Madison argued, Freedom comes from our humanity, and our humanity is a gift from God. And as God created us in his own image and likeness, and as he is perfectly free, therefore we are perfectly free. And our rights are as natural to us as the noses in the middle of our faces and the fingers on the ends of our hands. That was the argument Madison made called the natural law. Unfortunately, there was a big government crowd at Philadelphia, even in 1787. It was Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, and they argued that without the government, there can be no freedom, and as the government protects your freedom, it is the government that gives you freedom. And in bad times, the government can take the freedom back, 
and in good times the government can give the freedom to you and you can exercise it. Fortunately, because we have a Bill of Rights, we know that Madison and the small government people and those who believe in natural rights, as Jefferson had written in the Constitution, prevailed. And the Constitution was enacted only because the Bill of Rights was promised to be added, which it was three years later. And so our right to think as we wish, to speak as we think, to say what we speak, our right to worship or not to worship, our right to associate or not to associate, our right to protect ourselves. If anybody tells you that the Second Amendment was written to protect hunters' rights, there's some liberal crackpot from New York or California. The Second Amendment was written to allow you to protect yourself when the police can't or won't. And it was written to allow you to use it against the government if it is taken over by tyrants. All of these rights were written down. It's impossible to write down all of the rights, so they wrote down the Ninth Amendment. And the Ninth Amendment said just because we wrote down some rights in the preceding eight amendments doesn't mean these are the only rights that we've written down. But we have created a limited government. It can't do everything. It can only do the specific 17 powers, specific 17 things we have said in the Constitution. One of my favorite amendments, if you have to pick one, is the fourth. Because the Fourth Amendment stands for the greatest right there is after the right to life. And that is the right to be left alone. Today, today we call this the right to privacy. It guarantees that there are areas of human activity immune from intrusion by the government. And that immunity is as natural to us as our thoughts and our words and our expressions. And the government is obliged under the Constitution to respect that immunity itself and to protect us when someone else tries to interfere with it. Now, all of these things sounded wonderful in the Bill of Rights, and they sound nice as I articulate them to you today. Unfortunately, we have a sordid history of the violation of these rights. Think about it. In the second presidency, that's John Adams, the second president of the United States, the country enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien and Sedition Acts were written out of fear of the French. Oh, how the times have changed. <laughs> the French Revolution was going on in France. The government here was worried that something similar might happen. Jefferson had been the ambassador to, uh, to uh, Paris before we were the United States of America under the Constitution. He was the ambassador under the Articles of Confederation. So they wrote this bizarre law which said if you're French and you want to be an American citizen, you have to be here for 14 years. Oh, and by the way, if you are here, French, American, alien, foreign, natural born, whatever you are, if you criticize the government and bring it into disrepute, specifically the president, the cabinet, the Supreme Court, and members of Congress, you can be charged with violating the Alien and Sedition Acts and sent to jail for two years. How could the same generation, in some instances the very same human beings who wrote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, words that all of you can recite, the opening lines of the First Amendment. How could the same human beings who wrote that also write a law which says you can go to jail if you criticize us? By the way, did you note who was missing from that list of those that you can't criticize? The Vice President. It, it was Jefferson. He didn't care what they said about him. 
you remember a little bit of history. In those days, people didn't run on tickets. Everybody ran for president. Whoever finished first became president. Whoever finished second became vice president. Can you imagine how bizarre this would be in today's times? <laughs> Nevertheless, John Adams had a vice president who hated him. And Jefferson had a president he didn't want to talk to. But that was the law at the time. Congressman Matthew Lyons a small government Jeffersonian anti-federalist from Vermont said that President Adams was more interested in pomp and circumstance than he was in the powers of the presidency. Now, well, all right, Adams went along with that. And then Congressman Lyons went a little too far and he made fun of the president's waistline. And he referred to the president of the United States as his rotundity. <laughs> and for that, Congressman Lyons was indicted, tried, and convicted of violating the Alien and Sedition Acts because he brought the presidency into disrepute by mocking his waistline. Now, if you're from Boston or New Jersey or Chicago or New Orleans, you'll appreciate the second part of this story. Congressman Adams' jail term began two months before Election Day. So he ran for re-election to the Congress from his jail cell in Massachusetts. And he won. He was re-elected. Look, we can kid around about the anomalies in history, about how a country that complained about a king suppressing speech acquired power and its self-suppressed speech. Over 25 people spent the total of over 50 years, if you add up all their jail uh, times together, in federal jails during the presidency of John Adams because of their speech. What about the First Amendment? It's pretty clear. The Congress overlooked it and the courts overlooked it. That's why it's important that you understand what your rights and liberties are because a government that doesn't like you or worse yet, a government that hates you, or worse yet, a government that fears you, will overlook the natural rights that are yours and will not protect those rights, and you may just have to protect them yourself. This is a pattern that repeats over and over in our history. During the Civil War, whatever you think of the nobility of the Northern cause or the treacherous nature of the Northern cause, whichever side you're on. Was it a war against slavery or was it a war for power? Was it a war against states' rights? Was it a war to collect tariffs from ports in the South? Whatever you think. Abraham Lincoln locked up 3,000 newspaper reporters, not soldiers shooting at him, but newspaper reporters in the North because they criticized the war effort. And he argued that they were too dangerous to be set free too dangerous to talk to lawyers, too dangerous to be brought before juries. Does any of this sound familiar? During World War I, the Congress enacted the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act made it a crime to try and talk someone out of supporting the war. A crime to talk. Ask Abe Gitlow, an immigrant from Eastern Europe, who went into the basement of a friend's repair shop and cobbled together, if you're my age, you remember this, one of those old-fashioned mimeograph machines. You remember those? It was a barrel with a stencil with ink on the inside. If you spin it at the right speed and you put the paper in the right place, it would reproduce on the paper what you had cut on the stencil. So he cuts on the stencil. If you're drafted, don't go. The war is unlawful. Resist it. And he takes these crudely printed documents and he hurls them off the roof of a tenement where he lives on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Somebody gets it and gives it to the government and he's prosecuted, tried and convicted and sentenced to 20 years in jail for exercising his free speech. At the trial of Mr. Gitlow, the government couldn't find anybody who found or read or understood the pamphlets. He wrote them in Yiddish. <laughs> that statute under which Gitlow was convicted is still on the books today. When the New York Times exposed that President Bush had authorized spying without warrants, whatever you think of that issue, 
My own views are well documented on it. The Bush administration threatened to prosecute the editors of the New York Times under this same espionage act. Why does the government assume that it has the power to interfere with liberties it has sworn to uphold if the whole purpose of the American experiment is to demonstrate that we can pursue life, liberty, and happiness better on our own than by the central planning of the government? Why does it seem that the government is always resisting us on this? Why does it seem the government is always trying to tell us how to live, trying to make these decisions for us? All right, there's a knock on your door. You answer the door, there's a guy with a gun. The guy says to you, give me your money. I want to give it away in your name. <laughs> All right, what are you going to do? You call the police on this crackpot. It turns out he is the police. He's a federal agent. Come to collect your taxes and give the money away in your name. You just heard Glenn. Charity comes from the heart. The very root of the word for charity is the Latin word caritas, which means heart. It is impossible to be charitable with someone else's money. You can only be charitable when you give from your own. There are three ways to acquire wealth in this country. The first is by inheritance. Somebody leaves you a fortune. God bless you. Be generous with that fortune. That's the inheritance model. The second is the economic model. You trade a good, a service, an idea, a skill, the sweat of your brow for someone who's willing to pay you for it. This is what almost all of us use. And when the government doesn't interfere, we prosper with it. The third is the extortion model. Your money or your life. Which model does the government use? When I say on air, and I'll say it right here, taxation is theft. My friend John Stossel says to me, Stossel says to me, Judge, you're killing me when you say that. I said, what do you mean I'm killing you when I'm saying that? What are you talking about? He said, well, my people are emailing me wanting to know why I won't say it. I said, John, say it. <laughs> Think of it. The government presumes that it can just take as much money as it wants from us. Well, whose money is it? If you own your body and you own the fruits of your labor, natural law, you own the ideas that come out of your body. You own what you trade, what your body does, and what your mind thinks, and what your words articulate. That property is yours. The government doesn't have a claim on it. But we've established a government in this country that thinks it can regulate any behavior, control any activity, and tax any event it wants. And it's about time we said to them, there's a line thou shalt not cross. It's the threshold of my house. One day I was interviewing uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn, who's the number three ranking Democrat in the House over health care. I got the health care debate, seems like it was 100 years ago, it was only a few months ago. And I said to him, uh, Congressman Clyburn, can you tell me where in the Constitution the federal government is authorized to manage health care? And he said to me, Judge, most of what we do in Washington is not authorized by the Constitution. Can you tell me where health care is prohibited to us in the Constitution? So two very interesting responses. The first, the first response is amazingly candid but deplorable because they took an oath to uphold the Constitution, come what may, whether it pinches or it comforts, they took an oath to uphold it. And for him to acknowledge that most of what they do is not authorized by the Constitution is a rejection of that oath. 
But to say, can you tell me where in the Constitution health care is prohibited to the federal government, turns on its head the whole concept of a limited government. The federal government did not come into existence in order to right every wrong. It came into existence only to address the 17 unique, specific, discrete, delegated powers given to it by the Constitution, and health care is not among them. I mean, th think about what the federal government runs. The post office is broke. Amtrak is broke. Social Security is broke. Medicare is broke. Medicaid is broke. When the Mustang Ranch was taken over by the feds for failure to pay their taxes, they ran it into the ground. The federal government cannot provide booze and hookers to truckers in the desert, and they want to run health care. I mean, this, this, is, this is ridiculous, but it is a serious state of affairs when you think about it, that those we send to Washington do the opposite of what we send them for. I, I was on air with uh, one of uh, Glenn's and my more irascible, irritable colleagues, and we were going back and forth, uh, and he said to me, you know, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet, what's her name? <laughs> I know what you're thinking, and the answer is in capital letters, no. <laughs> she issues some kind of a proclamation saying that people that think the government is too big, taxes are too high, life begins at conception, the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental individual natural right, are danger to, dangerous to society. So I said to my more irritable, uh, irascible colleague, well, she knows that I believe government is too big, she knows that I believe taxes are too high. She knows that I believe that life begins at the moment of conception. She knows that I believe that the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental human, individual, natural right. But how does she know that anybody else believes it? And he looked at me and he said, well, I don't know. How does she know this? And I said, Bill? <laughs> because... She can read your mail before you get it. She can go to your lawyer's office and look at the documents there without you knowing it. She can go to your doctor's office and look at your medical records without you getting a whiff of it. She can capture every keystroke on every computer you touch without even getting a search warrant. He looks at me and he goes, well, where did she get this power from? She got it from the Patriot Act, which you, Bill, supported when the administration that you liked was in power. And now they're gone, and she has this power, and she will use it on those she hates and fears. Remember this diabolic offer. The devil comes out from behind a tree, and he says, give me your freedom, and I will keep you safe. A bargain one should never make, a bargain in which the freedom that goes to the government never comes back to us. The government tries to find an object of hatred. Throughout our history it has hated all groups, um, groups to which everyone in this room is a member at some point in time. The government hated Indians, the government hated blacks, the government hated Mormons, the government hated Germans, the government hated Catholics, the government hated Jews, the government hated Japanese. Who does the government hate today? It hates people that are successful. It hates people that have accumulated wealth. It hates people that are educated and are, and are in a position to challenge the government. Which is worse and more dangerous and which causes you less sleep at night? 
a ragtag bunch of fanatics hijack an airplane and fly it into a building, or a ragtag bunch of fanatics hijack the government and fly it into your house and your bank book and your doctor's office. On the 17th of July, in the year of our Lord, 2010, thousands of people who are the salt of the earth assembled in a beautiful arena in Salt Lake City, Utah, to celebrate the meaning, history, and understanding of human freedom. Five years from now, will there be anything worth celebrating? The answer is yes. In the long history of the world, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its maximum hour of danger. You are that generation. That is your role. This is that moment. Thank you and God bless you.